Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled, Why Many Firms Fail to Adapt Alternative Data to Asset Management and How to Do It Right. In this webinar, we will discuss common pitfalls when using alternative data in asset management and share various solutions to these issues. I would like to begin by introducing our speaker today, Josh Pantone. Josh is a co-founder and the CEO of Boosted.ai. Since starting Boosted.ai in 2017, the company has helped dozens of investment managers whose AUM totals over a trillion dollars, implement machine learning in their portfolios. As a student at the University of Waterloo, Josh co-founded his first company, Maluba, which was a deep learning natural language processing company. He has eight patents to his name, all of which are core Maluba IP. Maluba was later bought by Microsoft. Josh was also a principal machine learning engineer at Bloomberg for four years and led many mission critical initiatives. Now, before I hand it over to Josh, I'd like to go over the following webinar logistics. Number one, please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session via the questions tab in your console. We will be very happy to answer them towards the end of the session. Number two, this presentation is being recorded. A copy of the recording will be circulated within the next day. Without further ado, I would now like, like to pass it on to Josh. Thank you very much. Um, so just a little bit of quick background before I sort of dive into things. I'm the CEO of Boosted AI. Um, and we've basically built a system that's designed to make it easy for investment managers to incorporate machine learning and alternative AI into their investment process, both from a signal and kind of alpha generation standpoint, uh, but also from a portfolio construction and sort of risk mitigation standpoint. Um, and then as part of that, we do a lot of sort of data analytics with a very broad range of different types of clients. And to sort of motivate this talk, uh, we've seen firsthand that there is this massive explosion uh, of alternative data that's starting to appear over the past few years and is likely to continue to accelerate over at least the next decade or two. 50% uh, of you guys are already using, uh, or at least have already purchased alternative data. Uh, the spend on this was about 1.7 billion in 2020. It's a 10X growth in four years, and it's actually expected to accelerate more over the next decade. Uh, we have seen a 100X increase uh, in the number of data providers since 2000. And we've gone from having alternative data on a relatively small section of the market to about 630,000 uh, different securities um, worldwide that have where you can purchase some form of alternative data for it. Uh, and so this is a huge growing area. It's an area where a lot of you are already starting to explore. Um, and yet, unfortunately, there are a lot of sort of recurring problems on this. Uh, and so I'm not going to talk today about how to build a predictive model. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about how to sort of do the signal generation side. I'm going to focus primarily actually at the beginning of the pipeline and then in Future talks, we may talk a little bit more about the you know, machine learning um, predictive side and the machine learning for, for portfolio construction side. But for today, I'm really gonna be talking about the data itself, some of the really common problems that exist in the data, and really importantly, how we can both use machine learning to detect these problems and how we can ultimately fix them to make it uh, easier and better usable by further systems sort of down the pipeline. Uh, and really, I'm gonna focus on three things. Um, the first is around different forms of cheating that are really inherent to a lot of the data sets. Um, and, you know, it's just, I think it's a little bit of background. A lot of times, if you're a data vendor, you'll have some kind of novel idea for something that might be able to have some alpha and you go out and you'll find a data set around it. Um, but oftentimes data vendors themselves don't have a finance background, uh, or if they do have a, and, and they may or may not have a machine learning background, but if they do, they're not necessarily going to be focused on some of the problems that are inherent to finance. And so there's a lot of different forms of cheating that we see occur over and over again uh, in different vendor data sets. Um, there's also a lot of data sets that could potentially be very useful, but are not really useful in their raw form. Uh, of course, you know the, the standard for that could be structured versus unstructured, but there's all kinds of other problems with data where the general format that it's constructed in, um, the sort of element of point in time, the, the way that it's normalized, just makes it really hard for a machine to actually get good value out of the base signal. So I'm gonna be talking about that a little bit and how to fix some of those problems. 
Um, and then finally, well, I'm not going to talk about the model building itself too much today. I will talk a little bit about model interpretability because ultimately you can do a whole bunch of different things to fix the types of problems uh, that you find in your inherent data. But if the model that you're building is a black box and you have no insight into where, or how it's making its predictions, it's hard to be certain that you have fully eliminated uh, these different types of problems from the input data. So I think talking about model interpretability and model explainability is fairly important um, to the whole data cleaning, data analysis process uh, of using these alternative data sets. So just to kind of zoom in and, and focus on the first problem, and that is the problem of uh, what I would call cheating data. There's really three things that I would emphasize. Incorrect point in time data, data that um, is derived in an in-sample fashion and data with a form of survivorship bias. Now, when I'm talking about data that is not point in time, basically it is quite common that you'll get a data set provider where they'll say the market saw something on say Jan 3rd, but in fact, there's no way the market could have seen it until a few weeks later. Uh, this can also happen with sort of standard traditional data sets. The classical example is earning re releases. Uh, you know, maybe a company announces earnings on January 3rd, and then three weeks later, they announced a revised version of those earnings. A lot of times, depending on the data provider, they'll give you the sort of January 24th data and say that the market saw on January 3rd, when in actuality, there's no way the market could have seen it until January 3rd. Um, and if you do that, your machine, uh, with any kind of algorithm you build up that data, will learn from this. It'll learn and think that the data is a crystal ball. It'll make assumptions that'll look fantastic in a back test, but then you'll turn it on live and the whole system will collapse. Um, there's also a lot of times where you will potentially be looking at derived data, right? Uh, the classical example is, let's say I'm a credit card provider um, and I have built a model that uses credit card data to make a prediction about earnings. Um, if I didn't do a good job at making sure that I built that earnings prediction model point in time, uh, the earnings model um, could actually have a, a form of bias. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but again, if you're using these derived signals, any other machine learning down the pipe is going to learn from that bias and both learn the wrong things uh, and learn things that will work well in a back test but will not work live. And then finally, uh, there's a really big problem with different types of survivorship bias. You know, the, the most obvious form of survivorship bias is if you have a data set where they only have currently active tickers. Um, but those are the easiest to detect. Uh, a lot of times what you'll find is a data set provider where they'll claim to have complete coverage of both deactivated stocks and currently active stocks. Um, but in actuality, the way they collected data for the currently active tickers is different than how they collected data for bankrupt companies or companies that got uh, bought out. And again, that can be a massive problem because in all three of these cases, if your data is somehow giving, uh, you know, revealing some cheating information, if it's somehow giving some future view that exists as a result of poorly collecting the data, um, your machine will pick up on it. If you're using any kind of advanced uh, sort of modern technique, it'll pick up on that cheating. It'll assume that cheating is a real phenomena uh, and you'll produce a back test that'll work great and then absolutely collapse when you run it live. So I'm gonna be talking about how to find these different types of problems. I'll be talking about how some of these problems present themselves. And I think more excitingly, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how to fix them. Let's start with the first one, uh, cheating data that is directly giving look ahead bias. Um, let's say I go out and I buy some underlying data and my results look good. Maybe they look too good. Um, I start to ask the question, was the data valid? Was it a set of data the market actually saw? Um, or potentially, maybe I had a set of data where they're claiming the market saw it on January 3rd, but in actuality, there's no way if I was trying to run this live that I could actually have seen it um, until a few weeks later. Well, the quickest and easiest thing you can do is intentionally cheat. Uh, shift your time series backwards to give yourself an intentional information advantage that doesn't actually exist in real life. That is just kind of an artifact of how you've reconstructed the underlying data. And then take a look at how that compares. And if you deliberately cheat and the performance is the same, that is a 
really, really bad sign. Uh, that suggests that you gained no, you gained no advantage by intentionally looking at the future. Uh, and this suggests that probably your original model also is already looking at the future. Um, and so that's just the easiest thing. We just go in, make some perturbations, sort of shift the time series and see how that affects it over time. Um, so you go, the, you go in that, you do that, and maybe you have some questions, okay? Likely, I now have a cheating model that has some kind of look-ahead bias. Uh, the next question is uh, where? Where is that look-ahead bias coming from? What, uh, what is the particular data series that's causing the problem? Well, one of the nice things if you've done a good job of interpretability, which I'll talk about near the end of the presentation, uh, is you can kind of figure out what are the set of variables that are adding the most predictive value. And then once you have the set of variables that have the most predictive value, um, we can start to look at um, where the prediction is for each of these uh, underlying values. So we look at something called rank IC, rank information coefficient. Uh, and, and basically what we're taking a look at is um, if I take my underlying feature um, you know, sticking with the example here, maybe it's credit card transactions. Um, and I rank all of my stocks based on the credit card transactions. And then I compare that to my prediction. So maybe my prediction is earnings, maybe my prediction is alpha, maybe my prediction is just raw return, volatility, whatever. But I go in and I take a look at what does um, the rank correlation of the ranks of uh, my credit card data look like if I compare it to the ranks of uh, actual earnings. Um, and what you'll find is there's going to be some kind of correlation if the underlying variable is predictive. And generally speaking, that correlation uh, is going to follow some kind of decay. It'll, it'll sometimes increase over a few days. Um, but generally speaking, what's going to happen is it might be very, very predictive, say five days in the future, maybe may very predictive at the end of the quarter or something like that. But as time goes on, the predictiveness of that underlying variable should decrease. And the reason for that is really twofold. Number one, there is going to be more um, chance for systematic and other risks to sort of perturbate the statistical significance the further out you look. You know, to put it another way, it's harder to make a prediction a year from now than it is to make a prediction a month from now. So in general, you would expect the productivity of even a really good signal to sort of decrease over time. But the other thing that uh, is going to be affecting it normally is going to be mean reversion. Anytime you have any kind of uh, really strong signal, there's going to be kind of a mean reverting force that is fighting against that signal. Um, and so, you know, if I have something that does a really good job of predicting alpha, there should be some period of time where it's maybe predicted for, and then some period of time in which it starts to, starts to lag. Um, and so if I go in and I take a look at my variables and I start analyzing what that IC decay looks like over time, um, you'll start to find different types of patterns. I'm going to pull out one here. Uh, of really obvious bias, but I'll kind of mention there's there's many different forms of this. So, you know, if I go and I take a look at my IC decay and uh, <laughs> it's really, really strong on day five, and then it's basically random every other day, 99% that variable is cheating and it's cheating by exactly five days. It's giving you five days of forward-looking information that you would not have had access to in a real live run. Um, but you can see all kinds of other variations of this. Um, sometimes you'll go in and you'll see an IC that kind of increases exponentially. That's a really bad sign. That actually might be indicative of survivorship bias, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, sometimes you'll see these sort of weird sort of scatterings. Um, you know, without really going into all of it, what gets really interesting is when you analyze signal, we can actually use statistical and, and even ML uh, approaches to analyze what the IC decay looks like and use that to make predictions about the set of variables that are most likely cheating. And in some cases, you can even actually say this is exactly how it's cheating or exactly by how much it's cheating. Um, and then, you know, once you find that, there might still be a lot of underlying value uh, in, the, in the underlying data. Um, and so once you find that, you can just sort of shift it backwards, right? If I figure out that um, the data is on average uh, cheating by, by five days, um, I can shift it backwards. Um, the other thing, though, is, is sometimes you might just want to come in and, and fix it explicitly, right? Um, Maybe if I'm going back to the earnings example, maybe it's correct 95% of the time, uh, but in 5% of the time, they accidentally put in um, the revised numbers instead of the reported numbers. Uh, and so maybe you just need to make sure that you're kind of cleaning and, and swapping the data in. 
Um, you know, in some cases, there's a really obvious fix where it's like, okay, this is just obviously biased by this amount and we can just kind of reshift it in. Other times you have to be a little bit more creative, but the critical thing here is identifying uh, the data that's looking ahead and then kind of coming in and operating on it to fix that particular set of problem. All right, the next problem, which is honestly shockingly common, uh, is different forms of in-sample models. So oftentimes vendors might have some interesting set of data. Now, maybe I've got market moving news data, I've got geolocation data, I've got credit card data, I've got uh, satellite imagery data, whatever. And, and a lot of times uh, vendors will try, will, will sort of recognize that that data is maybe hard to use on its own. So they'll try to come in and maybe make a prediction model. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, one example of that, just kind of stick with the example, it might, maybe I come and I do credit card data, I'm using the credit card data to make um, uh, earnings predictions. Um, if I go back in time and I take all the credit card data from the past 10 or 15 years, and I train a model for that entire period for the past 10 years, and then I give you that model's prediction for 2015, that model is cheating because that model was actually trained on 2015 data, which is a situation that can never arise in reality, right? If I'm, if I'm making a prediction uh, for June 2021, I don't have access to uh, that data ahead. I don't have access to the June data. Uh, and so I can't make you uh, an in-sample prediction. And so if I did that in my back test, if I gave you earnings data, where for 2015, um, I'm trained on the entire year, you'll run into uh, some bias problems. And these can be a little bit more subtle. Sometimes the IC will present itself in sort of weird ways. Um, and unfortunately, the only way to fix this is to get access to the raw data uh, and basically make your own variation of the prediction model. So going through this exact example uh, of earnings prediction, what I should have done is instead of training on all the data over the past 15 years, for 2015, I should have taken the data from 2008 to say 2014. I should have trained on that data and then made my prediction in 2015. Then uh, when I go into 2016, I could then roll an additional year of training into my prediction model uh, and use that to make a prediction for the year 2016. And then I could go another year forward, et cetera, et cetera. So to do this right, you really need to be creating kind of a rolling window of uh, training data. And you need to make sure that that rolling window of training data is never interacting with the actual prediction period. Uh, AKA you wanna make sure that you're creating and building a model that is actually going to more or less follow how you'd run this live. And just kind of a shameless plug, this is all stuff that our platform can help with. Um, the other thing is uh, around survivorship bias. And this can actually be the most deadly, uh, to be honest, uh, because if you're not aware of survivorship bias or you don't deal with it, your machine can start to make some insanely risky bets that'll work really well in a back test and can completely blow up your book uh, when you run it live. Um, so more specifically, if a data vendor misses companies that have been delisted, um, then, and you, and you train a model on this data, then your model is going to learn, ah, not having this data means that I am guaranteed uh, to not go bankrupt. Um, and, uh, and, and you can imagine that could be a very, very risky bet to be making. If I'm buying extremely high, highly volatile stocks uh, that have had a, a massive drop down and my model has learned that there's no way I can ever go bankrupt, uh, you're going to get some extremely risky behavior that will actually look fantastic in a back test because there was never a bankrupt company in your back test, uh, but which will blow up your book really rapidly when you deploy it, uh, when you deploy it live. Um, and this doesn't just mean that <clears throat> the, they're missing data for non-active tickers. What's actually more insidious uh, is sometimes you have a data vendor where the way they collected data for currently listed stocks is different than how they collected data for delisted tickers. And again, your machine, because modern techniques are very, very intelligent in how they look for things, your machine can find that bias and assume that that bias 
is indicative of a company not going bankrupt or not going bank, uh, getting bought out. Um, and again, that can result in some very risky behavior that'll work right in the back test, but it'll completely blow up if you run it live. So survivorship bias, both in its direct and obvious form of just missing stocks and in its more insidious form of um, you know, collecting stocks differently for delisted, uh, collecting data differently for delisted stocks versus currently active stocks uh, is, is a very, very important problem to be fixing. Um, and so kind of on that realm, uh, here's an example of a model. Uh, this is just done in the TSX composite uh, that was made with data that we knew had survivorship bias. Uh, and you can see the historical performance of it uh, looks uh, kind of ridiculously good, right? It's, it's reporting a 21.56% alpha. It's reporting a sharp of 2.22. Um, you'd be thinking to yourself, if I turn this thing on, I should have a fantastic result. I turn it live and what does it do? Uh, it massively drags the benchmark. Actually, to be honest, this one isn't even as bad as it, as it could have been, but uh, certainly you can see there's a massive difference between its back test performance and its live performance. So how do you fix it? Well, the first and most important thing uh, is to make sure that you have a correct point in time basket of stocks that correctly captures whatever universe or mandate you're trying to go after. All right, I mean, the simplest thing is if I was doing an S&P 500 model, I need to make sure that I have correct point in time representation of all the stocks that existed in the S&P 500 in 2008. Any stock that went bankrupt, I bought out, whatever, it has to appear uh, in my 2008 representation of it. And same kind of thing for 2015, 2017, et cetera. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna be really careful that I have this representation on a, a, a monthly or even weekly basis. Um, and you know, you can take this for other ideas too, right? Maybe I'm trying to work on like a, a consumer discretionary basket, um, or maybe I'm trying to work on uh, a solar basket, right? Maybe I'm trying to make like a, a solar ETF, or I'm trying to make a solar portfolio um, or clean energy portfolio or something like that. Um, you need to make sure that you have captured all the clean energy companies that existed in 2015 and all the clean energy companies that existed in 2008. And you need to make sure that you have companies in there that have gone bankrupt or have gotten bought out. Because if you don't, your ML is going to learn some very bad lessons from the underlying data. Um, and so step number one is create a correct point in time representation of a given universe. Again, something we can help with. Um, and then the, the second step is to start looking at what your coverage looks like. Basically, once we know what the correct set of stocks should look like, and once we know the set of stocks that are getting delisted, we can look for anomalous behavior between the currently active tickers and the tickers that have gotten delisted over time. Um, and then finally, you can also start uh, just kind of directly taking a look at the dropout um, in your universe for the underlying data. And you know, there should be fairly consistent dropout over time. If the set of tickers is completely stable over a 15 year period, that's a really bad sign. So you know, step number one, let's create a, a point in time representation. Uh, this particular example is uh, fairly simple. We're just grabbing say North American tickers with um, market cap above 3 billion. Um, and then we're just going to come in and uh, take a look at overlap, right? Um, again, easiest thing is I know what my universe should have looked like in 2004. I know what my universe should have looked like in 2013. And the question that I want to ask is, did my coverage between the data I have show consistency in 2004 versus 2018 versus you know, 2012? Um, in this particular example, we can see the coverage is going down the further time, the further back I look. Uh, that is very, very bad. Uh, that is indicative that there is definitely survivorship bias in this. And I'm definitely gonna be learning some really bad things if I use the underlying data. <clears throat> and this is unfortunate because the survivorship bias is going to really overpower any other signal that that data might have. You know, again, let's just focus on, on the credit card data. It might be the case that credit card data is actually fantastic for making earnings predictions, or it might be the case that credit card data is actually fantastic uh, for making predictions around alpha. But if I have missed every company that went bankrupt, the bankruptcy signal 
is going to overpower any other signal it could actually learn from the data. And so, you know, number one, you're going to be building a, a model that does terribly live compared to the back test. But number two, which is a worse sin in my view, you might be actually losing legitimate alpha opportunities because you have set up your data in a way where no future model can actually learn from it uh, in an intelligent fashion, where the only lesson it can really learn from it is survivorship bias. So, you know, step number one, let's find that survivorship bias. But step number two, let's try and fix it. Let's try and actually go back in um, and sort of fill in some of the gaps so that any future model uh, can actually fill the stuff in. Uh, so it can actually learn the proper lessons from it, pardon me. Uh, and kind of the great thing here is if I have the data historically, and, you know, maybe the coverage is decreasing, but if I have the data historically, I more or less know what the credit card data should have looked like. And I can actually use other features, including the prediction feature, uh, to try to fill in and sort of interpolate what it should have looked like. So, you know, if I know for like 2015 or 2016, um, what 90% of my stock's uh, credit card data looked like, uh, and then for the remaining, and, and I also know, you know, what their earnings actually were. And then for my remaining 10% of stocks, I don't have uh, my credit card data, but I do know what the earnings look like. I can make a model to sort of fill in the gap and say, okay, for this 10% of data that I'm missing, here's what their earnings data probably looked like. Um, and, and again, I can kind of do that throughout my entire period. So basically what we're doing is we're going back through time. We're making a new prediction model. We're filling in the survivorship gaps interpolating it from the other data that we have uh, and then creating a, a set of data that doesn't suffer from the same survivorship bias. Now, it's really important that after you do this, you actually add in some noise to these interpolated features. Um, and it, it's a little bit tricky to get the right noise ratio, but you want to do it enough um, because otherwise you're at risk of introducing yet another form of, of look ahead bias. But if, if you do it right, you interpolate what the missing value should be and you sort of noiseify that you're gonna end up with data that's a heck of a lot safer to train from um, where your <coughs> um, sort of live results should kind of match your, uh, your historical results. Um, so what, what we're gonna do, we're going to go in, we're gonna look at the, you know, the set of companies where we're missing data, we're gonna interpolate what that data should have looked like. We're gonna fill in those gaps. We're then hopefully gonna create a smooth distribution where the overlap between my correct point in time buckets uh, and the overlap between my feature coverage uh, is more or less consistent. Uh, and then once I get a beautiful looking uh, overlap graph like this, I can then go in, retrain my model. Now, unfortunately, if you retrain your model uh, without the survivorship bias, your back test uh, is going to look a little bit worse. Um, and you know, just to look at a direct comparison, this is training with data that has survivorship bias. This is training with data where that survivorship bias has been fixed. And you can see that my sharp drops from 2.22 to like uh, 1.45. I'm, I'm losing a little bit of alpha there. Uh, still a reasonably good model overall though. Um, and you can kind of see this directly, right? My, my sharp drops pretty dramatically. Uh, actually, sorry, it's 2.22 drop down to about a 1.45. Um, however, when I run these live, my historical one that had survivorship bias, uh, you know, did terribly live. But my new one, despite having a worse back test, actually performs gorgeously live. It has fantastic alpha, uh, fully out of sample. Um, which, you know, again, just kind of emphasizes the point that survivorship bias is both deadly because it can lead to risky behavior in any models built from uh, survivorship bias data. But that number two, if you can fix it, there's a really good chance you're gonna find, and it's a good data set, you actually have a higher chance of being able to find alpha because anyone else that's trying to use that data that hasn't fixed the survivorship bias is just learning the really bad bankruptcy lesson. You're the only one who's actually been able to capture the true sort of alpha signal from it. Um, so being able to kind of model these types of data problems and then ultimately fix it, uh, I would argue is, is a critical element uh, in trying to deploy some of these data sets in any kind of quantitative way. And even if you're you know, working on it from the fundamental side, by the way, um, and you know, all you're trying to do is, is use credit card data to make a prediction about the company that's most likely to beat earnings or you know some other kind of similar KPI. This is still critical because your the 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 thing getting that bias is your own behavior, right? If if you're looking at this and every time you're seeing it out of a historical backtest, it seems to be making a solid prediction. You'll make assumptions about how it's going to run live. Those assumptions will make their way into your process, and it won't be quite as dramatic a hit 
um, as a quantitative strategy would be, but it can still affect you in negative ways. So even for a purely fundamental manager who's just trying to use some of these data sets to make fundamental predictions around KPI, I would argue being able to identify these problems and make better, more predictive models off of it uh, is still a really important part of the process. Um, okay, normalizing data. So there's a lot of different data sets that could potentially be quite valuable, could potentially be quite usable, um, but where they're not easily uh, comparable in their sort of underlying uh, form, right? And, and this can be vendor data, but this can also be traditional things, right? If I think about something like momentum, if I use momentum in its base, most standard form, there's gonna be a little bit of a size bias. Um, so I, I probably ideally wanna normalize it. Um, sometimes you might have data that's actually got a, a fantastic signal um, but has some form of, of, of sort of factor bias in it, right? Um, so, you know, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm using some sense of, um, uh, maybe I'm using some sort of data, you know, we'll stick with credit card data, um, where there's maybe a slight uh, momentum by tilt to it or slight um, volatility tilt to it or something like that. Um, and then the other thing is that um, there's a lot of data that, is going to follow kind of a weird distribution that a lot of traditional machine learning doesn't really handle very well. Uh, I guess the kind of easiest way to think about it, stock prices or stock market cap, I should say, moves linearly in log space, right? And AKA okay, everything's kind of exponentially moving over time. Um, and so a lot of underlying data will actually follow a sort of similar pattern, right? If you think about the distribution of revenue across different companies, you're gonna see these sort of like massive um, massive head with a really long tail. Um, and then kind of, you know, functional to all of this, there's also a lot of non-stationarity as a result of this. And, you know, to be more explicit, having a billion dollars of revenue in 1990 means something fundamentally different than having a billion dollars of revenue in 2021. Um, and so if you're not sort of handling that, if you're not normalizing that in your underlying data sets, it can be very difficult for a machine to learn lessons from data that's you know, 10 years old uh, that'll be useful in making predictions today. So I'll go through kind of a few examples of these and, and also a few examples of fixing it, but I'll just sort of mention, this is an extremely broad topic. Uh, we bring a massive array of statistical tools to trying to sort of analyze these types of problems and solve them. Uh, and so, I, you know, Unfortunately, with the time I have, it's going to be a relatively sh shallow exploration of it, but at least I can give you a little bit of an idea of, of uh, some of the ways that we think about it. Um, so just, you know, really quickly, um, I'm going to kind of naively grab a bunch of very simplistic sort of technical and, and maybe some balance sheet variables here. So, you know, we'll maybe grab like uh, the, what the base alpha is, the beta over the past little while, boiling your bands, uh, exponential moving average. Um, you know, again, we're just kind of randomly sampling some fairly poor uh, technical based variables. And I chose these variables uh, deliberately because all of them are gonna be suffering from some form of bias. Um, and then we go out and, um, and we build a predictive model off of this. Um, the, <laughs> the sharp is, is low, uh, 0 0.33. Um, you know, it, it does get a slightly higher return than the underlying benchmark, uh, but you can see that the standard deviation of this is like 50% higher than the underlying benchmark. Uh, this is a ridiculously volatile portfolio that I've built. Uh, and if I was to take a look at the drawdowns, it probably has some extremely horrific drawdown periods. Um, and so by just sort of grabbing those basic technicals um, and telling the system to make a prediction um, about raw return directly, um, the machine basically just biased and learned to bias to momentum and volatility, uh, which is a, probably in most cases a poor result, not exactly what you're looking to do. Uh, and again, you know, more specifically, and again, this was kind of a, a toy example, but just to sort of illustrate it, um, the model's not very predictive and to the extent that it is predictive, it's just biased towards these latent risk factors. So different ways that we can fix that. Uh, I mean, the, the first thing is we can just directly come in uh, and, and try to explicitly uh, sort of change our ratios, right? Um, if there's a, a feature that has a size bias, we can explicitly create a ratio that removes size from it. Um, you know, rather than making a prediction on return directly, we can make a prediction on alpha to sort of remove the, the beta uh, element of it. Um, you know, rather than just taking a look at 
Um, the you know standard deviation we can maybe uh, sorry standard deviation of, of returns we can maybe normalize that a little bit based on the underlying size or look at a few other metrics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, if we know what the what the underlying bias is explicitly, uh, we can sort of reconstruct our formula to um, to remove those forms of bias. Um, but the other thing too is is there's going to be a lot of data sets that um, tend to follow these sort of weird distributions, and I'm, I'm showing here an example of a, a log normal distribution, but uh, other distributions we'll see, you might see something that's got kind of a bimodal distribution, um, you know, different types of power series, you might see stuff that um, uh, you mostly some things that have normal distribution. Um, we, we see lots of data where there's non stationarity where basically like it's just kind of increasing at some rate over time, uh, and, and where the meaning of that data shifts every few years. Um, we'll see data where there is some form of seasonality. And this is actually really, really common. In fact, I'd say probably the most common thing is uh, data that suffers from seasonality, um, where the meaning in say Q4 is different than the meaning in Q1, um, while also suffering from non-stationarity, where uh, you know, it's kind of increasing over time. So you know, revenue of like consumer discretionary companies uh, would be an example of something that follows this, where it's got this sort of seasonality element, where you know Christmas season is always going to show a very different thing and they're going to have a very different meaning uh, than if it's like Q2, uh, but also in general your revenue is going to be going up and if you're a you know well-growing company it's going to be on a decade basis at least largely going up in sort of an exponential fashion. Um, and so once we know that there's these different types of ways and different types of data series that can kind of uh, show themselves, there's all kinds of statistical tools that we can throw at in terms of figuring out what kind of data series we think we're dealing with, what kind of time series we're dealing with, and then you know normalizing that. So again, this is just a really, really, really simple example, but I want to kind of mention that there's a lot of other variants, right? And so in this particular case, we figure out it's a log normal distribution. Um, we come in, do a log transform, and you know, voila, we now end up with this beautiful looking data on the right. Uh, that's a little bit easier for a machine to digest and discern. Uh, and so there's this sole element of sort of like data pre-processing and normalization um, that is really, really critical to creating the data in a way that presents really well where, you know, future algorithm uh, can do a good job of consuming it. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of go through that, uh, that last example. So again, still fairly poor feature space, but this time we came in, we fully normalized it. Uh, we fixed any of the bias problems. Uh, we created something that's a little bit more of an idiosyncratic prediction. Um, and, uh, you know, shockingly enough, um, we're actually able to drop the um, standard deviation to the point where it's lower than the underlying benchmark. We actually managed to get a little bit more uh, alpha. Um, and uh, our beta drops from like 1.2 or 1.3 or whatever it was before to, um, <laughs> you know, 0 0.66 with a you know, sizable increase in sharp. So normalization is important. It's extremely important. If, if you force the set of signals that your machine learning algorithms are grabbing to be sort of idiosyncratic and to not have any of these underlying biases, you're going to get much better results. Uh, when you build these really advanced machine learning models. And this is true if you are dealing with, uh, you know, standard uh, sort of balance sheet data or technical data. And this is also true if I'm dealing with credit card data or market moving news or, um, you know, foot traffic data. All these different things are going to present themselves with different sets of underlying bias and patterns. You need to detect those bias and patterns and you need to normalize them. Uh, and if you do that, you can squeeze a lot more prediction and a lot more value from the underlying data sets. Um, okay, last topic. I'll kind of breeze through this to leave um, a bit of time for questions at the end. Model interpretability. So I would argue the biggest thing that is holding back broader adoption of machine learning in the investment management space um, is really the black box nature of a lot of the most advanced modern machine learning techniques. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I combined with the fact that modern advanced machine learning techniques uh, will do a better job of sort of latching onto bias, right? One of the thing, one of the advantages of linear regression is that it doesn't do that good a job uh, of learning. And so if I give it really biased historical data, it's less likely to learn how to cheat. Um, machine learning, you know, modern machine learning techniques are extremely advanced. They'll latch on to any cheating signal really, really fast. They'll latch on to any bias really, really fast. And so, um, you know, one major problem to deploying it is identifying these different forms of problems, fixing them and, and doing that before you present it to machine learning algorithm. And I've talked about that extensively. But the second thing is once a machine has actually learned something from the underlying data, understanding what it learned and why 
is quite critical because you want to make sure that your normalization efforts were successful, that you successfully removed those forms of bias. Um, but also, once you understand why the machine is making a prediction, it becomes a lot easier for this sort of hybrid human and machine interaction. You know, the um, kind of a classic example I like to talk about uh, a number of years ago um, when, uh, when Netflix was, was getting a little bit of a dip. Um, a lot of uh, quantitative systems would be saying um, Netflix is, is a likely buy. And that makes sense if you look at the historical pattern that, you know, every single time Netflix had a drop, it, it eventually increased. Uh, but maybe if you were aware of the fact that Disney was launching a new competitive product, that might give you a little bit of insight. And that's something the machine might not know. So if you know that the machine just likes it because it's basically buying the dip, um, and, but you also know that there's maybe something new about the space that the machine's not aware of, you can make a better decision than just the machine sort of operating on its own. And on the flip side, if you know there's certain types of biases that you don't want the model to learn, being able to look at those um, and what it actually learned is, is quite critical. So we deploy some of the most advanced modern techniques. A, a lot of the machine learning we built has actually been done very specific for the financial market, but we've also done a huge amount of work on interpreting these advanced uh, types of, of models. And I'm just going to touch on this really, really, really briefly today. and just kind of mentioned there's a lot more under the hood uh, to what can and, and needs to be done, but I'll, I'll sort of mention a few different examples. So we kind of break model interpretability uh, into really kind of three different levels. Um, the first and easiest to understand is just at a top level, let's just learn, let's just look at what the model learned overall. So what this is showing you is basically um, the, the size of a feature is how important that feature was to this particular underlying model, but the distance between two features is how much they're actually used together. So this is telling us beta is a really important feature. Market cap is a really important feature, but they're, they're really important when they're used together. So beta is really important, but it's important in relation to the market cap. And beta is really important, but it's really important in relation to uh, the sales to EV ratio. Um, analyst expectations is really important, but it's really important uh, depending on the sector you're in. And maybe for some sectors, analyst expectations is actually not that useful. Um, and I can actually kind of go back in time and see what it learned and what's different for different time periods. So I can see the set of learnings that it had in 2017 is different. In this particular case, it's the same set of three variables, but you can see the embeddings, the, the way it interacts with other, um, other features has changed a little bit in 2017. <clears throat> and then I can go all the way back to 2019, where um, all of a sudden you start to see some macroeconomic features uh, are more important drivers in terms of the types of uh, types of stocks that things are particularly valuable. You know, market cap still important, beta still important, but all of a sudden, uh, different macroeconomic features have, have bubbled up to importance, and the interactions between those uh, macroeconomic features and underlying uh, fundamentals starts to become a little more important. So this can give you a little bit of a flavor for some of the things that your model is starting to learn. Um, but I can kind of zoom this out a little bit more. Um, and, and just start to look at the, the variables themselves. And, and what's really interesting about taking this view is we find there are some types of variables where even a really advanced nonlinear model will figure out that the variable on its own is useful or not useful. And then there are some types of variables where it'll figure out this variable is really useful, but it really needs something else to interact with me before it gets valuable. So in this particular example, um, the uh, further something is to the right, uh, the more likely it, it is a, a sell signal. The further something is to the left, the more likely it is, uh, sorry, further to the right is, is more likely to be a buy signal. Further to the left is more likely to be a sell signal. Um, the more orange you are, the higher the value of the underlying feature. And the more blue you are, the lower the value of the underlying feature. And so what this is telling us is for analyst expectations, if analysts love me now way more than they have loved me in the past, that is a strong buy, sell, buy signal. Regardless of anything else happening, if analysts love me way more now than they used to love me, that's a really good buy signal. If analysts hate me right now way more than they used to hate me, that is a really strong sell signal. So regardless of anything else happening in the world, analyst expectations on a relative to myself basis um, is, is a strong sort of univariate, single variate uh, uh, predictor. Um, on the flip side, if I look at assets to price, I can see here, or actually let's, let's look at, uh, if, if I look at uh, nine month price momentum, price momentum is very clearly giving me some signal, but I can see a lot of orange mixed in with the blue. And what that orange mixed in with the blue is telling me 
uh, is that yes, nine month momentum is important, but it's important when you combine it with other features. I can't just blindly look at price momentum and, and make an assumption about it being good or bad. I really need other features to be sort of acting on that, uh, which then lets us get to the next part where we can say, okay, cool, tell me what is interacting with these features and how is it deriving value from it? Um, and so then we can come in and start to see these really, really in interesting interaction patterns. So what this is telling me is that um, for the energy sector, having a low price momentum uh, is actually indicative uh, of a prospective buy. Um, and for the energy sector, um, having a high price momentum uh, is, is actually the, the opposite signal. Um, and so it, for the energy sector, it seems to be doing some kind of you know, odd sort of long range uh, mean reversion. Uh, but you can see for every other sector, um, they're, they're kind of bouncing out and, and it's, not, it's really learning something different. And, and you know, what's kind of interesting is if we actually go through this example, we find that for this particular thing, for this particular model, momentum, some sectors uh, the, the machine will find are, are good sort of momentum plays and some sectors it finds uh, do better if you're looking at it from a mean reversion standpoint. Um, but you can see this for other things too, right? It might figure out that like price to earnings ratio is uh, a really good thing for uh, say industrials and um, uh, materials companies, but maybe price earnings growth is the best signal for technology companies, not just as, as an example. Uh, and so by being able to come in here and sort of see number one, like what are the most important variables, but also number two, how are these variables interacting? How is it sort of pre using variables in combination to make predictions? You know, number one, you can start to learn insights that you can start incorporating into your own process. But number two, you can start to really understand where and how did the machine learn things um, and, and start to get a little bit of a sense of, did it learn something intelligent that makes logical sense or did it, you know, potentially learn some form of bias uh, from the underlying data set. Um, and then kind of the final way that we'll look at this is all the way down to the, the stock prediction level or the security prediction level, I should say. Um, so this is a prediction made by this particular model in say January 29th of uh, 2021. Um, and it's saying that uh, it really likes the stock. Does it really like the stock? Well, because its momentum is, uh, its historical momentum on a nine month basis is lower than its peers, um, but analysts love it way more than they've ever loved it historically and they love it uh, against its peers way more than they've loved it against its peers historically uh, and it has a relatively small market cap so based on all this information it thinks okay this is a prospective buy um, on the flip side a name a lot of us are probably familiar with uh, around the same time period um, it thought tesla was a short why did it think tesla was a short well it's got a large market cap um, and, 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 and not only does it have a large market cap, but it's been growing over time. So you, know, you can see at the bottom, it's got that one green signal where it's like, you know, this is a little bit of a warning sign. This stock has been growing for a long time. So that gives me a little bit of pause on my short prediction, but ultimately um, it's noticing that there's some interesting things happening with the interest rate. Um, and it thinks based on the fact that analysts hate it, some of the interesting stuff happening with the interest rates uh, and it's, you know, historical momentum, this is very likely going to be a torpedo. Um, and so, you know, again, you may disagree with the machine, but by kind of understanding where it's coming from, uh, it gives you a good sense of, did it learn something intelligent? Is this, a, you know, are these real patterns that it's kind of picked up from the data? Um, and then how do I actually want to sort of interact with that? Um, okay, I, I think I ended up going about one or two minutes over, um, but I wanted to leave a little bit of time to questions for the audience. So thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, I'll turn it over to Sarah to uh, suggest some questions. Thank you, Josh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, let's begin with the questions and the time we have at hand. Number one, how do I trust that your solutions algorithms are working properly? Yeah, so um, I guess there's kind of a few answers to that. You know, the, the first thing is um, everything that we've set up underneath the hood, we, you know, we, we do a lot of work around um, cleaning the underlying uh, data sets that, that come in, um, but we're also doing everything uh, kind of correct fully out of sample. So when I create a simulation um, on like a 10 or 15 year back test, what I'm actually doing on a 15 year back test is, is creating at least 15 models or maybe as many as, um, uh, you know, maybe as many as, as 150 models or something in that range. So, so what I'm kind of doing is uh, for 2009, I'm gonna take all my data from 2000 up to 2008. I'm gonna learn from that data, produce validation across the period of 2008. And then when I get to 2009, uh, I simulate it the exact same way that I would simulate uh, a prediction for a, um, 
uh, for, for life, basically. Um, and then I'll kind of do that across the year. And then at that point, I can roll in another year of data. And I'm doing that consistently. So our entire prediction is done fully out of sample. Um, and kind of the comment I'll make is we find it can be frustratingly difficult to make a good back test in our system because we've done such a good job at eliminating all these different forces of bias. But on the flip side, if you do make a good back test, uh, we have found that the alignment between the live performance and the historical back test performance is extremely close. Now, the other thing, and I don't talk about this too, I didn't talk about this presentation, but we also do a lot of work around, um, you know, statistically verifying that we didn't PVAL hack and statistically verifying that in the grand scheme of things, the results you got are, are significant. And um, I mean, there's all kinds of other ways that we can set up different tests, sort of evaluate our system, but that, that's a basic idea. We, we approach it, I would argue, in a way that's distinct from a lot of different platforms. We focused on day one with solving a lot of the core problems um, that you'll find with the different data sets, creating a really consistent back testing and evaluation platform, uh, which ultimately gives a lot more confidence about your live performance versus your historical performance. Thank you, Josh. How do you deal with M and, M and A in the context of survivorship bias? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a, probably a little more of a loaded question than you thought. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it, whoever was asked that. Um, so there's a few things there. Number one, uh, I need to make sure that I've got a correct point in time universe, right? I need to make sure that if I go back to say 2015, that I have all the stocks that got bought and that got sold. Um, however, it's also important that I deal with my time series correctly. And one of the most frustrating things is that I've yet to find a security master that has properly dealt with M&A. Uh, if I wanna just pick on ISIN as an example, uh, ISIN sometimes will take the smaller company from a merger and acquisition, and ISIN will sometimes take a larger company from a merger and acquisition. Uh, and so if I'm just using ISIN and I'm relying on that to get my sort of canonical entity and I'm taking time series in sort of a naive fashion, you actually get to this really odd inconsistencies in your underlying time series that will potentially break you a little bit. Um, so uh, as insane as it sounds, we actually had to build our own security master basically from the ground up, sort of look for a lot of these underlying problems in the underlying universes that traditional stuff like QSIP and ISIN have, um, in order to create a correct canonical version of what the universe looks like. And then once we did all of that work in creating correct canonical point in time representations of the universe, we're now able to compare that to any other data series or any other security master and sort of identify the problems really, really quickly. And then, you know, ultimately go in and fix them. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the answer is just a lot of data work uh, from the ground up and <laughs> focusing them on, on the data series themselves. There's not really a, an easy solution, I'm afraid. Thank you, Josh. Next question, what are the names of the kinds of plots used in the model interpretability section? What are the names of the, say that again? Names of the kinds of plots uh, used in the model interpretability sections. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, can, I can talk a little bit about that, I guess. Um, I, I will say that we kind of tackle it from two sides. Um, one side is basically about creating perturbations in the input side, doing that in a statistically intelligent fashion and, and making sure that um, we uh, don't suffer from some of the other sort of standard problems. Uh, I can mention what other people do. Um, so a lot of other models will use stuff like LIME, uh, local interpretable uh, model explanations. Um, and uh, uh, different types of distribution functions or they'll, you know, doing tree-based models, they might look at the number of, of nodes. Um, there's different ways of trying to induce it from a neural net. I will say the vast majority of model interpretability that's on the market today suffers from uh, consistency problems uh, and suffers from uh, problems around how it explains it. So on, on the consistency problem side, if I look at like Lime as an example, uh, I can create two different seeds of Lime and get a completely different ordering uh, of which variables it thinks are important and which variables it thinks are, are not important. Um, so while I'm not gonna talk about exactly how we solve it, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can mention some of these other systems and say we're very familiar with those sets of problems uh, and have addressed them directly in our platform. Thank you. Next question asks us, does your platform come equipped with data feeds or only the back, tech, back testing infrastructure? If I have to bring the data, is your platform capable of supporting multi-currency port portfolio analysis? Yeah, so number one, uh, we have a partnership with S&P Global and FactSet. So anything you'd see in Capital IQ is immediately integrated to our system. 50% of our clients bring their own data. 50% of our clients are purely using data in the system. Uh, beyond FactSet and S&P Global, we've got 
just a crap ton of other data sets in there. We've got option volatility data. We've got data around different uh, sort of Fed movements and a few other more novel things. Uh, so yeah, the, the platform comes well equipped with a huge amount of data. Uh, it's extremely easy to integrate your own data in though. We've got a whole bunch of different ways to do that. Uh, and then finally, yes, we absolutely can support uh, multiple currencies uh, and all kinds of other different types of problems I'm sure you're encountering. Great. If you did, and if you do provide basic security data, do you allow custom data points to be attached to your existing time series? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, there's all kinds of ways of, of interacting with the data set. It, it's a little bit difficult for me to describe without actually showing a demo or, or kind of talking about the platform. But yeah, there's uh, all kinds of ways you can interact with the data. Awesome. Can you elaborate more on the importance of backtest with a real life example? Uh, very quickly. We have four minutes left. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, some of the stuff I showed in this presentation is, is a direct example, right? So uh, if I create a back test um, that has, say, survivorship bias as an example, um, you're going to have models that pick up on um, very risky stocks on the assumption they won't go bankrupt, and then you know, those same stocks will do terribly uh, in live. I think another thing too, though, is um, you need to make sure that you're building systems that are sort of consistent. I, I think 2020 as a whole was a really hard year for many quantitative systems. Uh, and I would argue that's because a lot of people did a fairly poor job at trying to model in regime shifts. Uh, so I didn't really talk about that too much this, but I, all of 2020 is a good example of back test gone bad. Uh, the average quant performance for a lot of different groups was, was quite poor. Uh, and again, a shameless plug, but uh, we actually had a really good year in 2020. Um, generally speaking, anyone using our product uh, had their best relative performance periods in March and November, which is time periods where a lot of quant systems kind of broke down. But uh, yeah, thank you. Next, <laughs> next question. Awesome. What is an example of one of the more interesting alternative data sets that happens to contain strong predictive return signal? <laughs> um, I would so, like to answer that. Yeah, I, I, look, I'm not going to call out specific ones. I will just say. Uh, it is fascinating the variety of data sets and things they've been predictive on. Um, you know, I've seen things like trucker boards uh, where it's like, you know, what, um, how much space do trucks have? Um, what, uh, what are they asking for? What, what goods are people asking to move? And that can give you some really strong macroeconomic signals. Um, you know, I, I've seen stuff where credit card, I've seen spaces where credit card data is predictive. I've seen spaces where it's extremely unpredictive. Um, I think ultimately it really depends on your mandate and the strategy that you're trying to you're trying to tackle. And then based on your mandate and the strategy and the space that you're looking at, there's ultimately going to be you know many different types of data that could be applicable to that particular problem. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen dozens and dozens of different data sets, uh, and I have yet to see a winner take all. Uh, if that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, next question is a bit of an interesting one. How, how do how do you overlap or compete with some of the larger companies? I'm not going to name the companies, um, but the ones that provide general purpose AI solutions that can be applied to different verticals um, at the same time, uh, if, you'd, if you'd like to take that question. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we kind of do a bunch of different things, right? We, we have a whole piece around data ingestion, cleaning and analysis. We have another piece around alpha prediction or just general signal prediction. We have another piece around portfolio construction, risk mitigation. And then we have another piece around, you know, building a really solid sort of back testing and trading system, right? Um, and you can find people who can, who tackle these different verticals. But I think what makes our platform particularly different is it's frictionless. You just upload your, your data into our system and immediately you can kind of start incorporating it into an investment process really, really quickly. Um, so to the extent we have direct competition, it's really gonna be different verticals, right? I mean, on the portfolio construction side, of course, like an Axioma or a Barra would probably be the, the closest thing to direct competition. Um, you know, maybe on the um, on the like data and signal generation, maybe the closest thing might be like a, like a data robot or, or an H2O or something like that. Um, maybe, um, you know, on the, on the signal generation side, um, or, or on the, on the trade execution side, you know, there might be a, a few different systems particular to that, but as far as I'm aware, there's, there's very few offerings in the market that kind of do what we do, where it takes the full picture, everything you could possibly need to deploy a machine learning model directly into your investment process and kind of seamlessly integrates it into one platform. Awesome. I'll, I'll squeeze in one last question. Any additional comment on avoiding back, avoiding or detecting look ahead bias and a resolution if that's the case. Yeah, so, uh, you know, quickest, quickest answer is, is, is cheat deliberately and then see, see what it looks like. But like putting that aside, um, 
a lot of us, a lot of what we do is just really around uh, signal analysis, right? So what did your model learn from the underlying data? Um, and then what, what does the predictive value of that look like? And survivorship bias really has a lot of, not survivorship, sorry, look ahead bias tends to really have some telltale signs where you'll see some form of abnormal, no, abnormality at some point in the future. Um, usually kind of around where the, where the cheating is. Now, sometimes it's really hard set where it's like, you know, you got a data series that was deliberately, that was intentionally, unintentionally lagged by five days. Sometimes there's a little bit of statistical variation there. We are gonna get a few kind of weird dips where you get those weird spikes in IC that don't really make any sense. Um, but, you know, long story short, like go in, take a look at how your models are, are getting prediction from the underlying variable or, or look at the predictive value of the variable itself. Analyze that series and then look for statistical abnormalities. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about all the different things we screen for, and I'm not gonna talk about all the different ways that we approach it, but I, I can talk a little bit, that's kind of how we think about it. We look for um, the, the signal itself, the signal strength, what the signal looks like over time. And we use that to predict if it's uh, you know, a logical signal or if there's some kind of cheating. Great, um, and with this, uh, we'll end. Thank you for taking the time today, Josh, and doing a great presentation. I'd like to say a thank you to everyone who joined us today. The presentation recording will be sent in an email within the next day. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks, guys.